in your username, uh, please do so now. Um, so thank you all for being here uh, for this conversation. Um, this is really just the beginning. Decolonizing science is a really complicated and many times contradictory effort. Um, so know that this uh, conversation is really a beginning. Um, it's not the definitive or expert discussion on decolonization. Um, and it doesn't happen in a two hour Zoom meeting, um, but our purpose today is to really dive deep with the intent to move closer to not just being scientists, but scientist advocates who use science um, to serve the people. Uh, and the people, the working class, black and indigenous communities in the US and the Philippines to whom we are accountable. So right now we're just gonna lay the groundwork before we begin really diving into this conversation. Um, so please keep the dialogue going in chat, Olivia's moderating. We have a lot to cover, but we're going to structure in some time for discussion, activities, and Q&A. So next slide, please. Okay, so let's just arrive right now in this present moment um, and have the open lines inquiry. Our first question that we asked you all was, what lens are you on? So why do we need to acknowledge the land? Why did we ask you to do this exercise that you've likely done before in other settings? And these are some of the definitions from two sources that I like, um, but I've learned that land acknowledgements are really considered a tribal protocol, right? And that means recognizing the ongoing colonization that has been the enduring antagonist of black and indigenous communities for centuries. So land acknowledgements make space for the truth in a settler colonial society that keeps erasing it. And Olivia's gonna go over those terms, you know, settler, settler colonialism with you um, in a while. So land acknowledgements are really a counter narrative to the dominant story. So no, Columbus did not discover Turtle Island, known as North America. Magellan did not civilize the Philippines. And you know, despite centuries of genocide and forced removal, indigenous people are still here. So land recognition is an active process. And the listeners, you know, all of you right now, including myself, really needed to allow it to change our relationship to the land and the people it belongs to. So, you know, this was your first task of decolonization by acknowledging the land, but we're gonna go ahead with this conversation because we really need to move beyond it, beyond simply knowing it. So, next slide. All right, so here we are as Filipino AX scientists in AFSA, Association for Filipino Scientists in America, and in broader communities. Um, AFSA was just formed one year ago and already, we have 72 different scientific fields um, represented from marine biology, epidemiology, biochemistry, and education. So the question is, whose land are we on when we do our scholarship, our, our experiments, our fellowships and field work? Next slide. So in preparation for this workshop, I found that AFSA's members occupy roughly 470 indigenous lands in North America, Guam, the Philippines, and Australia, um, whose original inhabitants have lived there on their respective lands for thousands of years. And some of these tribes that I've listed here um, are federal, federally recognized and some of them are not. So Olivia will later uh, help us better define the impacts of imperialism, but this is really it in plain view. The doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny that justified Western expansion on indigenous lands um, has really come to define scientific institutions and values today. So some might call that progress, um, but we always have to ask in this space, you know, at, at what cost, um, at whose expense. So we come to see that these ideologies have also been absorbed by countries in, in the Philippines um, through militarization, occupation um, by imperialist countries. And that leads to violence and displacement of indigenous people in the land. So colonization is perpetuated by governments, by institutions, um, by people. Um, so, you know, if you're from New Jersey, Washington, Arizona, Colorado, and exist here, do you know like the broken treaties that have allowed you to live and work on that land? Next slide. So this is really a space of hard truths, but also in learning what we even believe about Filipino identity and culture, which is also rooted in colonial mentality, right? 
So for example, I'm a non-Indigenous Filipino who grew up in New Jersey, attending Catholic school with Tagalog speaking parents, um, you know, we celebrated things like Christmas and Halloween. So I'm not gonna have an identical experience to uh, a Moro Igorot friend um, or even another Tagalog descent person who lives like in California or another state. So we use the language of the diaspora to invite a plural Filipino AX history that must also center indigenous uh, Filipino experiences. And even within indigenous tribes, there's a wide array of variations in traditions and languages and even the dances and the decision-making practices. So um, indigenous people, Filipinos are also scientists and they're also in our community today. And we accept that all indigenous people exist in the present and future tense. And that romanticizing a pre-colonial indigenous identity is also a form of erasure. So even using Filipino at all is kind of complicated, but that tension and the tensions that we're presenting is okay. We can, we need to confront those things. So we're moving towards complexity um, as another task of, of decolonization. And so is finding ways that we all unite uh, with the working uh, class and indigenous people. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, Olivia, let me know if there's anything going on in chat. Um, but I'll just continue. So the Association of Filipino Scientists in America and beyond, um, we're really privileged in a privileged role to challenge these systems of oppression and land acknowledgement is just the first step to doing that. So this is a variation of the acknowledgement that APSA presented during their anniversary event this weekend to celebrate their one year. So I'm just gonna read it. So the Association of Filipino Scientists in America honors in the past, present, and future tense the Lenape people, the original inhabitants of Manhattan, New York, where APSA was established a year ago. We also honor our indigenous Kapabayan in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao in the Philippines. As occupants of the U.S. and other colonial territories, we recognize our participation in, in historic and ongoing settler colonialism. As migrants crossing over the Pacific to Turtle Island, North America, our diaspora is an amalgamation of complicit bystanders and colonizers, as well as resistors and collaborators. APSA stands in solidarity with movements to return land and rights back to the peasant and working class indigenous people whose sovereignty, knowledge, and self-determination we strive to uplift through our science practice. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Kyle. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Christiana, and uh, welcome everyone who just entered. Um, so I guess to establish before moving forward, um, we do really encourage a lot of discussion here, um, and we're really happy that um, if you're here right now that you have taken interest um, in this discussion and in this ongoing dialogue, as Christiana said. Um, but we did want to establish sort of just some community agreements moving forward um, when we do have these conversations. Um, so one of the first ones being like, what's said here stays here and what's learned here leaves. Um, so Vegas rules, if you want to call it that, but basically just um, being respectful of what people share here, but then like take advantage of like what we all have and like the uniqueness of people's experiences, right? Um, and you'll be surprised with how much you can learn not about, not just about other people, but um, also yourself during this time. Um, and then just really embracing discomfort. Um, and that means leaning in to these conversations. Again, like Christiana said, um, it's a privilege, right? To an extent to be able to talk about some of these topics um, given some of our positions or backgrounds, right? Um, so really like just be open um, and coming into embracing, like challenging ourselves to think critically about these things. Um, and that also means that um, just be mindful of, uh, about the impact um, that you say, um, even if the intention wasn't malintended, um, just think about what impact the things that we say or deliver here um, might have on other people, um, as well as listening to other people to understand. This is one of my favorite ones. I think it should be included in like just every workshop ever, but really listening to understand perspectives and not to respond, meaning I think a lot of times when we have discourse, people are in their heads and trying to think, all right, what can I say um, to respond to this? Or what can I say to sort of like, um, I guess like, what can I say back? Um, and sometimes you can get in your head and forget to really just understand where people are coming from. Um, and then this is for those who, um, 
make space, take space. This is for those who, if you are one of those people that naturally have a lot to say, um, I encourage you and challenge you to maybe take a step back and allow other people um, to maybe take that space and share their own experiences, right? Um, even though I'm sure everyone has a lot to say or might not have a lot to say, um, I really challenge you to go against what you would normally do. So if you're the kind of person that usually tries to just listen and linger and maybe are a bit shy, I, I, we encourage and challenge and invite you all to um, really speak up and don't be afraid to share your own personal experiences. Um, we really do value this conversation. Um, and really, at the end of the day, like whatever you take from this workshop um, today on Tuesday, um, from like six to eight, like just really whatever you take out of it is what you put into it. Um, so um, we really thank you all for, uh, for being here and yeah. And so this is kind of our agenda that we have uh, lined up for the next couple of hours. Um, so yeah, I will pass it on to Olivia. Yeah, so we'll start off this um, section with science imperialism and decolonization. Next slide. So um, if people can um, use the raise hand function, if they're willing for this section to read off of a slide to help me out. Okay, Lex. Science and imperialism. We will argue, oh, I don't know what happened to my screen. Oh yeah, there's a glitch. Okay. In, okay, it's good. Okay, thank you. We will argue that science is inevitably political and in the context of contemporary American corporate capitalism, that it contributes greatly to the exploitation and oppression of most of the people both in this country and abroad. We will call for a reorientation of scientific work and will suggest ways in which scientific workers can redirect their research to further meaningful social change. The ruling class through government, big corporations and tax exempt foundations funds most of our research. In the case of industrial research, the control and direction of research are obvious. With research supported by government or private foundations, Controls are somewhat less obvious, but nonetheless effective. Major areas of research may be preferentially funded by direction of Congress or foundation trustees. Okay, thank you so much for reading. So um, this quote is from Science for the People magazine. And this is an ongoing magazine, but it was founded around, I think, in the, the 70s when um, a lot of like, activism um, in America was um, popping off. And a lot of the times, like, um, there's the stereotype that scientists are not activists, they're not advocates, they're, they're not drivers for um, political change. But here you have um, this group, Science for the People, which has, like, a longstanding history. And this, um, art, like, this quote is taken from this article that was, they wrote in the 1970s. And it's basically saying that um, science is political because of who um, funds, who funds science who control science um, and who like, you know, like they're like the scientists that do all the work, but who it, like, who are the scientists doing the work for, for what purpose? Um, and Science for the People, their mission was to expose like, um, you know, like where this money was going to, like what, um, what people's, this institution um, were oppressing. And also they were um, trying to, um, drive this message that um, scientists should stay organized and they should be at, um, advocates of um, political change because science is political. Um, next slide. And then can I have someone volunteer to read with the raised hand function here? Kila? Yeah, sorry about my video. Um, millions of dollars are spent on space research while pressing domestic needs are given lower priority. In medicine, money has been poured into research on heart disease, cancer, and stroke, major killers of the middle and upper classes, rather than into research on sickle cell anemia, the broad range of effects of malnutrition, higher incidences of most diseases, etc., which affect mainly the lower classes. Anthropologists studying social systems of mountain tribes and 
Indochina were surprised when the CIA collected their information for use in counterinsurgency operations. Psychologists exploring the parameters of human intelligence for purely scientific reasons unintentionally created intelligence testing instruments which, once developed, passed out of their hands and now help the draft boards conscript men for Vietnam and the U.S. Army allocate manpower more, I can't read the last word, more effectively. Yeah, thank you so much. So, yeah, so here are um, different examples of different sectors in science in which um, research was used for, um, research for like purposes of the work, um, the ruling class or like, um, like upper classes. You know, it would like in medicine, it was used for um, major killers of the middle and upper, like um, diseases that affected the middle and upper classes rather than diseases that affected most of the population. Um, and like anthropology and um, psychology research was used for war. Uh, which again, um, the the victims of um, war are often like the masses, um, poor people in um, the countries in the global south. So we could go on and on for like each sector, but you wanted to put an example of you know like a couple various like sectors to give just a wide example of like how um, science is used to like a, can be used. Um, if we're not careful, to use to oppress people and commit violence. Um, and we should always be questioning what this, what research, um, who the research benefits and who is it hurting. And next slide. So again, we should always ask, science for whom? In any industry or sector, we must ask the questions, for whom is this work for? We must not only ask who gets funding so not just diversifying who gets funding not um just questioning like oh like whether um black or like filipino scientists can get funding um but who is funding this work who has the power to fund and for what objectives so and as we see in the previous slides um uh, many of whom who fund this work are the rich um and the powerful and is this a science for, do we want science to be a science for the ruling class, the rich, or do we want science to be a science for the people? And here's a, um, an image that says science for people, not for profit. Okay, next slide. So um, on the right um, is a zine that I made a year ago. It's called Decolonizing Environmental Education. Uh, which Christiana is going to share in the chat. Um, and some definitions, like some starting definitions. Indigenous means um, First Nations, Aboriginal or Native peoples. Indigenous peoples are groups of people who inhabited land before colonizers settled on it. And two, another way of looking at it is a radical state of being and thinking and intentional effort add to the second definition is that it's not just a like when you have like indigenous people who um, honor their indigenous ways are also victims of um, military violence of mass violence um, because um, their way of living is a threat to um, you know it's a threat to the ruling class it's a threat to um, like to settlers so um, along with being like indigenous, there's also like a lot of violence that comes with it. And colonialism is defined as control by one power over a dependent area of people. In practice, colonialism is one country violent. When one country violently invades and takes control of another country, claims the land as its own and sends people, settlers, so that means us, to live on that land. And that definition was uh, shared by Teen Vogue. Um, I, that that inclusion of um, the definition by Teen Vogue was intentional. Um, I wanted to share a definition of colonialism that was um, very accessible, um, that could reach everybody. So next slide. So now that we um, have a basic understanding of what does it mean to be like indigenous and what is colonialism, um, so this process of um, committing violence against indigenous people and taking, taking their lands and basically uh, replacing them 
um, and replacing the entire like indigenous societies with um, colonial societies. What is decolonization? You know, a lot of people use um, these terms very differently in different spaces. Um, and it's even for me, like sometimes it's hard to like understand what that means. So um, there's this, this is also from the zine that I made and this was adapted from decolonization, the meaning what exactly, um, which the link can be found in the zine. And it shows the many definitions of decolonization. So um, going down, um, it can mean breaking free when a nation seeks to bring, become free of the oppressor or oppressed regime. It can mean settler removal for the settler to withdraw from stolen lands, either by physically leaving or by symbolically abolishing settler selves. It can mean return the land, so for indigenous peoples to return to ancestral lands. It can mean resistance and resurgence, which can mean dismantling oppressive systems that affect indigenous folks and POC empowering indigenous heritages. It can mean de neuro decolonization. So unlearning Western ways of thinking and relearning indigenous ideology. It can mean re-indigenization, meaning reclaiming our root ancestral heritages, understanding who we were before colonialism. It can mean we have all been colonized, understanding that indigenous sovereignty is tied to the liberation of all peoples. And it can mean all of these things at once. Um, so as we can see, like, um, it can mean like liberation as in political liberation, as in um, breaking free from um, oppressors and the ruling class. It can mean physically returning the land to indigenous peoples. It can mean um, unlearn, like it can mean this like process, the individual process amongst ourselves, like unlearning what we learn and relearning indigenous ways. Um, and it can mean organizing. It can mean organizing amongst the people um, to bring liberation to like indigenous peoples and all peoples and our, ourselves too. Next slide. Next slide, okay. Um, so we just covered a lot. So some questions that I have are, uh, what resonated with you um, like in the past couple of slides? Um, what resonates with you in this this um, this image in particular, and any other questions that you might have? Um, I guess I'll start. Um, so I feel like decolonization. Um, a lot of people might be resistant of because they might think like, oh, well, you know, we've, yeah, we've taken their land. Like, what are we supposed to do? Just give them back their land? Like, what about all the people that are here? Um, and I feel like I resonate mostly with the resistance and resurgence where you can dismantle these systems that are very oppressive to those that we've displaced and that we can somehow find a way to live together where they aren't treated like second, or well, what's the term like, um, second class citizens. And um, yeah, yeah, I just feel like resistance and resurgence is a great way that we can give back to, um, to those people. Yeah, totally. Um, I've heard that um, discourse a lot in which when we just reduce decolonization to just returning the land, um, it can kind of treat all settlers as monolithic when really there is a difference between, say, like a, a working class migrant and a billionaire. Um, but technically, they're both settlers. Um, so it is important to understand like there, there are like different degrees of like um, responsibilities that people have, different um, degrees of power that people have, and also different, so many different ways in which we can decolonize and they're all important. I, I have a little bit of a question, um, if you don't mind. Um, so I, I'm thinking about particularly the 
fact that the Lakota had been, you know, driven out of the Black Hills area, which has traditionally been very important to them. Uh, a lot of people now live in that area. What does it mean to abolish the settler self um, within that context of now you have people that live in that area who are not, you know, Lakota or who are not native to that to that area? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if people in the chat could have ideas, um, I can share my thoughts. I'm by no means um, an expert. I might not even be right. Um, but some things that come to mind is um, being in genuine relation to the, the Lakota people, like understanding doing the research and understanding like how to make um, genuine relationships with them, understanding what their needs are. Um, it can be as simple as trying to use the internet and trying to do research on like what um, political issues um, that they've been facing and how to organize with them or like against their oppressors. Um, really it's to, when, um, when we try to like abolish settler selves, it's understanding what within us are settler practices and how can we stop them and how can we resist against them on an individual level and also on an organizational level um, when we organize and um, organize amongst um, other people and other like settlers or like other like willing um, people who are like in resistance um, to organize and against um, settler societies so that that's just something that just came up to mind right now um, if anyone else has an answer to that question please feel free to share What was the question again? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's just, um, what, what does it mean to abolish the settler self within the context of people who are currently occupying settled land? Um, I guess specifically within the context of, you know, occupying land wherein the, the people are very, very close by. You know, not not very far away. Like, who is occupying the settlers? Uh, yes. Occupying the land. Because yes. Our, this land is stolen from from the natives, right? It's stolen from the Native Americans. It has to be returned to them. It has to be returned to them. So I'll just give an example. In the Mohawk Valley. And six nation they were they were the, the Mohawk were placed in reservation in the boundary of Canada and, and New York there's uh, 16 acres of land that was given back to the Mohawk by the owner that's why there is the Canada Haligi um, where Tom Porter is living right now so that kind of consciousness has to be raised among settlers that this land has to be given back to the to the in the case of the Lakota, it has to be given back to the Lakota. So, and how to do that? Uh, well, use the privilege that that we have. We have we have lobbying. We have to stand in solidarity with them in in uh, fighting. And there's there's a lot of organizing among the Lakota people, but they are in the disadvantage because even in the disease research, see, they the Native Americans is the highest diabetes number two, and what is that? And the highest highest alcoholism, and what is that? Because it is designed by the structure that they will become alcoholic, it's designed by the structure that there's no healthy food around the reservation, so they'll get diabetes number two. Uh, there are literatures about that in the APHA, 
So maybe you can delve into that and see as a, as a budding scientist, as a scientist, where can you partner with the, with the indigenous people in taking back their land, giving back their land, like that 16 acres that was given back to Tom Porter nicely with ceremony. Now they're down, down in Canada, you Haligen at Funda, Funda uh, Albany. You can ask Christiana, she was there. So that's just one of the examples. But the fight of the Lakota, it's because there's so much la minerals in their land. Just like me, I'm indigenous from Mindanao. The continuous neocolonization and seeds of the Moro people, it's not just because we're Moro, it's because there's so much minerals and, and uh, geothermal, you know, the, the utterium. Uh, uh, deposit in that area is very, very big, very the largest in the world, and that's a target of the imperialists. So, that kind of consciousness we have to look into, and what kind of action are we going to do scientifically to be in the side of the indigenous people? Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank that you. is very helpful. Yeah, thank you so much for that discussion. Um, there's some discussion happening in the chat, but for time's sake, uh, we'll move on to the next um, the next section. But just to emphasize that you know these this is a very hard discussion. Um, we're only here to start it, um, and it's really important to keep revisiting um, and keep like having these discussions within your own spaces, whether they're in scientific spaces or or like not, um, because this is a lifelong journey in terms of what does it mean to decolonize? What does it mean um, to bring liberation, um, to fight alongside indigenous peoples um, for liberation? Um, so yeah, and another thing that I would also add um, if, to anyone who is wants to start this journey is don't be afraid um, because indigenous peoples don't have that choice. So um, I'll pass it off to Kyle. Thank you, Olivia, for going through that good section. Um, so next, we're going to go into um, the first of two skills lab that we have planned for tonight. Um, and we will include content warnings um, throughout. Um, and we do have discussions. So um, yeah, again, like what we've been doing, uh, feel free to participate in the chat also, if you don't feel like you get a chance to speak um, just on the call itself. Um, but so this is this kind of goes into what we've been discussing, right? How do we build relationships? Um, with the people in the land around us, right? Um, so I think that is a good segue from where we just came off the heels of. Uh, I think the first part I do want to go over with this or that we wanted to go over was this idea of implicit bias. Um, so we've been talking a lot about system level um, versions of colonialism and system level um, versions of oppression, right? Uh, I think it's very easy to kind of be adapted to that both on a system level and a macro level but then also there's a lot of ways that um, colonialism can show up even in just our interactions, right? In our interpersonal lives, in a more intra level, um, even within ourselves. So um, starting off with implicit bias, I do kind of want to ask um, anyone in the crowd if they want to just give a def definition of implicit bias, um, one that they know or learned about or just, um, yeah. Let me hear some of y'all, someone new maybe speak and define implicit bias for us. I guess I, I don't I necessarily have like a dictionary definition, but I think of it as like sort of unexamined or subconscious assumptions that you have that inform your behavior without you really being aware of them. Yes, perfect. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's exactly kind of basically what we have, um, a bias in judgment um, or behavior that results again, um, like you said, subtle cognitive processes, right? And I think this goes back into what Olivia was mentioning earlier about neuro, um, neuro-colonialism, right? Just our ideas. Um, one of the ways that I've learned about um, implicit biases was that they're socially ingrained. And one of my favorite sort of exercises that I've seen in previous workshops was, um, if I say, row, row, row your boat, automatically in your head, right? You know what comes after, right? You kind of know what to fill in that space, right? It's gently down the stream in case you didn't know. Um, and if I ask you again, 
right? And no one has to actually answer this. But if I ask you, where exactly did you learn that? What specific time point, what setting was it? Do you remember who it was, where you were? And most people, um, unless you have incredible memory, um, which would be good for you, but most people, right, don't really remember, right? It's something that's kind of just been taught in upbringing and something that's just kind of subtly and repetitively been ingrained. Um, and so biases are the same sort of way, right? Where we have them, but we don't necessarily have a pinpointed discrete event where we learned it. It's something that's gradual. Um, so some example of, you know, bias in scientific research. Why is it important that we think about biases and implicit biases? Um, so examples that we have up here um, are this emergence of this uh, new term called WEIRD, right? And WEIRD is an acronym that stands for white, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. And so there's sort of this movement and this sort of acknowledgement that a lot of samples that are used in a lot of scientific research has been WEIRD, has been these demographics specifically and not necessarily a lot of representation if you don't fit this bubble, right? And so thinking and being mindful about the kind of samples that we're researching and including. Um, and then another example I have here is from this really good textbook um, called Decolonizing Methodologies. Um, and one of the quotes there is that, the first encounters with Europeans were ones in which indigenous people were observed as research objects. So um, the first bullet point and the last are sort of current examples and then this quote is sort of a historical background to where did um, the stem and how has it been originated? How, how did it originate and how has it been sort of subtly taking newer forms um, in our current time period right now? Um, and so even just from the very beginning um, of, of encounters, you can see that there's this sort of power dynamic, right? Where indigenous people are the ones that are subjected to being the researchers the, or being the objects of research. Um, whereas Europeans are the ones that are the ones doing the observing. So um, sort of a historical context that we, we've seen as Olivia explained in the previous section. Um, but then even for, for us, right, as, as AFSA or members of AFSA or people outside, um, gaps in representation even in Philippinex and Asian sample sizes, right? What kind of samples are we doing? Are we just doing Asian samples, right? And we know that within Asian samples, there's a lot of nuances um, between ethnic groups right? Um, there's not a lot of de-aggregated representation a lot of the times, but even within Philippine examples, are we being inclusive of indigenous people, indigenous cultures that are represented um, in our reports of Philippine examples? Um, which ones are the ones, are, are we over-representing a particular type of Philippine X, right, with a particular background? So thinking about these um, overall in whatever field that you're studying in, right? I think is important when we're applying research. And so we challenge y'all, right? To examine your implicit biases. Um, maybe some of you might be familiar with this. Um, Harvard developed an implicit association test, which is online. Um, I think you can just type that in and you can choose from a variety of different IATs, right? Um, one in particular I think is interesting is race, but also Native American um, and even just like um, xenophobia, right? Just general stuff and even gender and science, right? As scientists. So um, just recognizing what kind of biases do you recognize in your own research? Um, and we really encourage y'all to look at it and thinking about it and at the same time realizing that everybody has this, right? There is no innocent or there is no free of this, right? Everybody, all people, regardless of identity, um, are guilty of implicit biases. And that doesn't necessarily have to be evaluation of your quality or your um, evalu an evaluation of who you are as a person or your, um, yeah, or your like morality, right? It's more of just accepting and acknowledging that these exist. Um, and so that's a lot of ways that implicit biases can be influencing science right now, more so on a personal and interpersonal level. So to counter that, right? what we're suggesting or what literature has suggested is this idea of cultural humility. So could I maybe get someone again in the crowd to sort of give their own version of cultural humility, what they think it sounds like. It's two, it's two words that I think if you put it together, I believe y'all could come up with something that comes close. Um, yeah, anybody who, who feel free. Uh, I, th I think it might be, maybe the idea that um, 
our own culture, the culture that we come from, we should, it should be recognized as not being better than other people's cultures. Maybe. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I can't, since I'm screen sharing, I don't think I can see the name, but thank you for speaking. Um, so the definition that here is being aware of cultural differences and participant perception. So you are right, right? You acknowledging, first of all, my culture isn't the only one or the best one. Um, and then the second part to that is what are the perceptions of people from the culture that's outside of mine? So yeah, thank you for participating and volunteering. Um, and so these are some other definitions that I thought were relevant to that, right? So what you were explaining was ethnocentrism, right? So you make judgments thinking that your culture is the dominant one um, and you don't really acknowledge um, aspects of another culture, right? And so the counter to that is cultural relativism, which is um, a sociological term and very similar to cultural humility, but it's this perspective, right? And Christiana is going to talk a lot more about perspective um, later in this workshop. Um, but thinking about that any aspect of a culture should be viewed in, within the context of what their experiences are. And so again, some examples of the need for cultural humility in scientific research. Um, so this first one um, was the case of the Boston naming test. So this is especially interesting for those who are in neuropsychology, but really any science um, where the Boston naming test was sort of used to measure perceptions. Um, and so they flashed sort of images, black and white images, and you were supposed to name the image. And that was how they sort of recorded how well you could recognize things, And it was used to test um, participants with aphasia or kind of cognitive difficulties and perceptions. Um, one of the issues that came up with the test was the inclusion of a noose item, right? Um, so just imagine being, for example, a black participant who they show you a black and white image of a flower and you say flower, black and white image of a tree, you say tree, and then they flash a noose, right? And so what they did notice and they did research on it was that black participants who were taking this test did test different contracts or did test different contracts and reacted differently to the image of a noose compared to one, um, to one wow, to white young adults. Um, so even thinking about something as simple as like the type of items we use in our testing, right? is something that, first of all, who were the people that were in the room when designing that study or designing that measurement and that scale? Right, and how could cultural humility have maybe made it so that the inclusion of the noose, which is a violent, um, a racial violent image or symbol for, for many black Americans, um, given the history, right? What, how could cultural humility have maybe, maybe ensured that that wouldn't have been included, right? And to save sort of the psychological harm or the differences in um, the black participants. But in addition to that, it's also changing how black participants view science, right? Um, again, just trying to imagine like what, how would a black participant feel if they come in and they're being recruited and they're taking this test, they see a news and they leave with sort of that violent image and knowing that that was something that was included and not really mindful of, you know, what their background might've been. Um, and so it's something, even if it seems to us, something very simple and minuscule can actually have a large impact on another demographic. And so I think I, I call to attention again this idea of intent versus impact um, and implicit bias. I don't think the people who designed the scale were inherently prejudiced um, or automatically prejudiced. But again, it's something that was because it was not something they thought about, um, did have a large impact regardless of their intention. And then the next thing I wanted to call to attention to is the character, characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, and so I do have um, a slide for this next, but there was basically an article that lists out all the different characteristics in our professional lives and in scientific lives that we've normalized that is actually aspects of white supremacy culture. So um, um, I'm just gonna list out all of them. I'm not gonna go one by one, but all of these, right? And so I'm not gonna, there's a lot, I don't have enough time to really go over each individual one to, to an extent, but really just reading it and thinking in your head, you know, what does this mean? How does this show up in my professional life or in my scientific life, right? So for some, some examples, right? We think about um, perfectionism as something that's just normally valued, right? Or even quantity over quality. Um, but a lot of these are aspects of Eurocentric culture um, that again, we've 
seen as normal because it's the row, row, row your boat again, right? It's the, it's the rowboat song, it's the implicit bias, it's something that's been ingrained into us. Um, it's something that's so normalized that we never even thought to really challenge or question it um, until these people, whoever it is, um, made the article did, right? And so thinking about who, what is the dominant culture that's pervasive in a lot of our scientific settings, who are the ones that get to make what is normal and who is being excluded out of that or who are the ones that didn't really ask for this right to be the normal so just thinking about sort of cultural um, ideas that we might want to um, question or even challenge at times and so um, again there is a large push for cultural humility in scientific research i do love this quote a lot because um, it does emphasize that it's lifelong it's a lifelong commitment um, and it's not going to happen overnight, but it will help, right, with um, a lot of different dynamics, patient, physician, or even with partnerships with communities. Um, and so thinking really about how cultural humility in your own personal research, whatever, whatever you're trying to pursue, um, whatever specific field you're studying, how can cultural humility help? Um, and so this is an activity that we had, um, which is sort of we kind of want people to participate and think if you were to explain or describe your science um how would you maybe explain it from to a middle school student or a road scholar in their field um or a community organizer uh, i think christiana did you want to also elaborate more on the this part as well yeah so part of accessibility is being able to speak in the language of the people that you're serving um so having the awareness of your positionality and the important um, cultural considerations that um, matter when we interact with folks. So we wanna make our science accessible. So this is a great way, you've probably already done this in your life, but how would you explain your science to a middle school student? How would you explain it to someone in your field? How would you explain it to someone who's a community organizer? So, you know, in your words, it doesn't have to be, um, it's good to kind of enunciate how you would approach um, and use the language to be to bridge right your science with the community. Um, so maybe for a middle school student, I'm a social worker. I would say, um, as a social worker, I use um, the uh, qualities of um, you know forgiveness and community and caring for other people to improve uh, people's, to help solve problems with people, right? So in their language, uh, right? And that means getting to know the people that you're serving. Does anybody wanna give it a try? No judgment here, we're just sharing and practicing. Anybody? It's it's not as hard as it looks. Give it a try. No judgment. <laughs> I'm curious to hear what some of y'all are are working on. So I'd love to. Yeah, let us know what you do. <laughs> you can just explain it to us if you want. Which is. I can go ahead. Um, thanks for having me. Um, this is a really interesting conversation and and needed. I I work in public health and um, I have actually done talks for middle school and um, elementary school kids and what i say i'm an epidemiologist but i say i'm a i'm a doctor for the pop for the population so um i take care of the population's health instead of an individual cool yeah that definitely makes it sound really cool um, i'm sure to them it's like whoa it's like a lot of people <laughs> does anyone else want to anyone else want to share um, maybe even to let me let's try a community organizer maybe um, if anyone wants to anyway. um, I want to share before um, I um, take all this my my what I believe in in research is community participative research that the scientists are not the researcher alone and the researcher is not the researcher alone, but the community themselves. Because most of our research, 
we use the community for our paper, for our, for our study, publish it, and the community doesn't even know what is the result. I think the nearest in liberating research is community participative, not only using the community as a subject, but teaching them to be scientists themselves, teaching them the process of scientific thinking so that the effect of the, the result of the research is not to the researcher alone, but for them to realize that this is the situation of their community. So uh, there's one research that we did uh, among Filipino immigrants, which is, you, you know, community health worker as an intervention to, um, to reverse the hypertension, cardiovascular disease of Filipino immigrants. So uh, that's just one of the papers because there's not much um, papers, there's not much literature about the cardiovascular disease of Filipinos per se. And we supply the world with scientists. We supply the world with nurses, the number one exporter of nurses in the whole world, number one exporter of doctors in the whole world, but seven out of 10 Filipinos die without seeing any medical help. And also the question is, I grew up indigenous and I have to become a nurse because during the time when I was growing, being an, uh, an, a village healer is, is like you're hunted together with what is they're calling now red tag, like you're part of, you're unwanted, you're an aswang. So, but then to realize later, periwinkle, Periwinkle is a flower that is wild in the Philippines. If you will look into Oncovin, Oncovin is a, a cancer drug, is coming from that flowers. And they learned that from the indigenous healers back home in the Philippines. Now it's, it's patented by a company. So, and Ilang Ilang, you know Ilang Ilang? No, nothing, nothing sweet as smell you could ever have. But who owns Ilang Ilang now? It's uh, one, of the, one of the brand names that we go and buy that perfume. So um, I think as Filipinos, we have to look inside us. Um, I, I got this, I mean, oh, my question always is, for whom are you studying for? Most of the time, we are at the mercy of the funders. Whoever fund us, then we make that study so we can gain the doctorate degree. So those are the things that we have to look into and perhaps reverse. Uh, I don't have much answer, but in the length of time that I have been trying hard uh, to look into to look into how to legitimize. I use the word legitimize because when you say something like, oh, you just use a uh, Adelpha flower, Adelpha bark, boil it, and uh, the, there will be good uh, oxytoxic effect for the mother and all this. Who cares? That has to go to the laboratory. Then all of the sudden, it's already studied by some laboratories and owned by pharmaceutical companies. So we are at the mercy of these companies, first pharmaceutical industries. Anyhow, um, thank you. I have talked too much. Thank you so much for that. That um, what you just said will like ties into um, our other stuff about access and our next session, indigenous knowledge systems and sciences. But um, yes, go off. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you everyone for um, who have been listening in. Um, uh, definitely a lot to think about and really comprehend and digest, right? Um, and so, uh, again, yeah, like, again, it starts with a lot of these system level things. Um, it starts with examining, right? Like what she said, um, really look inside ourselves, 
right? And think about what it is within our own selves, our own biases, how we can be more um, cultural, culturally humble in our work. Um, but then also acknowledging that like there are system level things too. Um, and so this is where access comes into play, right? Meeting people where they are and again, actively diversifying your means of engagement. And that can sort of help with mediating these biases and also in increasing sort of how much cultural humility is in your life. Um, and so just again, again, I think this is a question that's been brought up a lot, but um, reimagining scientific research, right? So first of all, it, it takes knowing what scientific research is now, right? So we've talked about that, but now try to reimagine what an ideal science, like what ideal scientific research would look like. Um, and again, the central question is to whom is your science accountable, right? And like it's been mentioned, a lot of the times it's just the funders. Who are the people in power? Who are the people who are taking up those positions of giving that money and providing it? Um, and so just being mindful about what is the research, where is the research from, and then who is the research for, right? And those kind of circulate a lot too. And so thinking about your own position and maybe ways in your own interpersonal um, interactions, you can sort of change the system from the inside. Um, and that's, that's a discussion in and of itself that could take ages, right? Um, but uh, we do need to move on to our next section, um, which is Indigenous Knowledge Systems and, and Sciences. So I'm really excited for this section. Um, everybody give it up to Christiana. Yeah, this is my section. Um, but I also want to highlight stuff that there's a lot of good stuff going on in the chat. Um, we don't have enough time to go over it, but people have been sending resources like a book and iNaturalist, which is great for community involvement in ecological research. Um, and going off of what Poultry said about, um, you know, like we have to look inside ourselves um, and we have to look to indigenous people um, in terms of like what other like alternative knowledge systems are there. And there's indigenous knowledge systems and sciences that we can look towards. Next slide. So, um, for example, um, there's a practice of cultural burning um, that is very relevant because of the fires um, in the beginning of the year, which happened in Australia um, and are happening now on the West Coast. Also, Kyle, the, um, the slide looks very glitchy right now. Um, so for more than 13,000 13, years, the um, Yorok, um, Tarok, and Hupa, Miwok, and Chumash tribes um, and hundreds of other tribes, um, don't quote me on the pronunciations, across California and the world use small intestinal burns to renew local food, medicinal and cultural resources, create habitat for animals and reduce the risk of larger, more dangerous wildfires. And native people are trying to revitalize their right to indigenous cultural burning, a practice that was criminalized long before California became a state, before their culture dies out. And um, this is a quote, um, our first agreement with our creator was to tend to the land. It was taken away from us, and now we are trying to reclaim, um, reclaim it. So here you have this practice by people who have lived here about for thousands of years, um, and they would um, do like um, I forget the exact term, but they're like lo small local birds um, to that targeted like you know dead trees, um, like other like dead things um, to clear the land because they believe that. Uh, fire is medicine. Fire is clearing. Um, yes, prescribed burns. Thank you. Um, and, you know, this was a practice that they had for thousands of years and settlers came, um, colonized the land, and then they um, made it illegal. And now we have to live with the consequences in which the entire West Coast is on fire. Um, and now um, scientists are look, um, looking back at indigenous peoples and being like, oh, you were right. Um, which is, of course, they were right. They were living here for thousands of years. Um, so now that there's a, there's a lot of research on how fire is medicine and we it took us this long it took us this much loss to realize like we should have been listening to indigenous people who have lived here for thousands of years. Next slide. Um, another example, um, there are indigenous astronomy so there's a lot of uh, folklore that um, say that you know indigenous peoples believe that um, we come from the stars. Um, which is true. This, that's what um, astronomers say that, um, you know, like we are like, you know, like we are products of the stardust. Um, and that's something that you can find in folklore, um, 
like among like indigenous peoples around the world um here on the right you see um constellations in like like um indigenous concepts of constellations in the sky um there's a lot of examples of indigenous folks um you know like they would use the like the stars to travel and um for navigation um you know this is like an old old practice um and there are so many different examples among like that many different sectors um you know like um like herbalism um medicine um uh like uh the sea like etc et and which you know like all of this knowledge is like age old knowledge next slide Um, another example, we have the Lumad schools. So the Lumad are a collective of various indigenous groups in Mindanao. Um, and they do not have access to their own schools. So they started organizing their own schools where they would teach children how to read and write um, and other indigenous knowledge systems, such as like, you know, how to farm, how to hunt. Um, and the Philippine government has threatened, harassed, and arrested students and organizers of these Lumad schools. And some Lumad schools have been forced to be closed and or been threatened to be bombed. So um, here, this, this is very important because the Lumad people, they need to learn um, how to read and write because that's what um, like legal documents are in. Um, and there have been like the, the, this is a way in which the Philippine government um, has been trying to take land from them, which is have them exploit their lack of knowledge of like, reading and writing to have them sign away their land without knowing it. So they're trying to teach their children how to like read and write. Um, and the government doesn't want that. So the Luma people have to go through immense violence in order to uh, learn that. And also like they have to go through immense violence in order to learn um, these systems of knowledge that they, they, they own, like this is their land. Um, and no, they're, they're going through this because, you know, there's like a lot of like minerals and like other like resources that the, the Philippine government and by extension, because the Philippines is a new colony of the US um, that the, the US wants. Um, so that's what's going on with the Luma people in the Philippines. Next slide. So complicating the word science. So um, for people, for those who are not um, that aware of this discourse there this is a very lively discourse in which um western non-indigenous scientists and indigenous scientists are trying to um, integrate and recognize indigenous sciences so if you look up the term indigenous sciences and are in um traditional ecological knowledge you'll find like a lot of articles and research about how um indigenous knowledge systems are science and how um they're being worked towards being integrated into the system um, However, we need to we need to be mindful, you know, why do we need to call it science in the first place? Is it a word truly liberatory for indigenous people or is it a word that grants indigenous scientists more funding? Um, do we need indigenous sciences to be lit legitimized by Western science? And why? What power structure does that make apparent? So uh, for example, I'm taking herbalism classes. And, you know, like a lot of this knowledge is like ancestral knowledge um, that, you know, originated from indigenous people. And there is this movement among like scientists to try and legitimize like, oh, like, you know, this, this herb does this, this herb does this. Um, but, you know, like it didn't take, like America is like, what, 200 years old, 300 years old. Um, it, like it didn't take us 200 years to figure out what ginger does. We've known what it does for eons and we didn't need any scientific institution to prove that. Um, but now there's like all this like scientific research saying that this herb does this and this like, um, and like scientists are in like a rush to prove like that, like traditional indigenous, indigenous knowledge is science. But why would we need to do that if we trusted those people in the first place? Was that how was how that how we discovered it? Or was that how indigenous people discovered that knowledge if they had been using that knowledge for eons, you know? And for those who those for scientists who are indigenous, you know, we like 
as we said, like who controls their science? Like who do they have to appeal to in order to do research? Who is funding their research? And you know, like why do we have to like use in the word science in the first place? Why not art? Why not, um, you know, like other words? Why not an indigenous, like why not indigenous words? Um, these are questions that we want to ask that we don't have an answer to. We just want you to think about them because they're very complex and um, we don't want to leave as much as there's a lot of um, rich discourse on indigenous science and indigenous knowledge systems, um, we want to make sure that we don't just leave it at that. It's a lot more complicated than that. So I think we're on to the next section. Thank you. Yeah, so we're gonna uh, start with the skill slab again, uh, the value of empathic engagement in science. Um, next slide. So again, my name is Christiana, my pronouns are she and hers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, being a social worker and social work. Um, so social work is a field that a lot of people may mostly ascribe to or describe as just helping people and not really have a, a fuller perspective of the kind of purpose and principles that drive um, social work, which is really to improve the outcomes of the people that we serve. Um, and that's many people. So as a social worker, I, my role is to be a facilitator uh, in the process of change for individuals and systems. And the primary mode of that is through human relationships. So we are ethically mandated to uh, advocate for human rights, access and social justice um, as social workers. Um, social workers are viewing human re relationships as the main method for meaningful change. So when I think about like decolonization, of course it means um, a multitude of things from land back to reparations. Um, but I also think about how the violence of colonialism, you know, is a widespread trauma and how our relationships to each other and other systems and the land is the means towards liberation. So the question I pose is, you know, how do we build that genuine relationship to the land and the people around us as scientists? All right, so next slide. Okay, so you'll see uh, here a comparison of the general social work uh, intervention model and a broad definition of the scientific method. So there are clearly some parallels. Um, both are nonlinear processes that start um, problem solving through you know, observation, assessment, generating possible solutions and questions, intervening and then experimenting and analyzing you know, our findings. Um, but what's different is the engagement part, you know, the first part here on the intervention model. Um, because social workers deal with human beings and human behavior, so we begin by engaging, right? Building relationships with our clients, which is what we call our people that we serve. Um, and the engagement process never ends, it's ongoing. And I believe that fundamentally sciences, even if you're just working mostly by yourself uh, in a lab all day, it's always about humanity, right? The purpose of science is, is to improve human life. Uh, next slide. So there is value, right, in empathic engagement in science. And we're gonna get there by exercising our empathy muscle. Um, so we're just gonna watch a short video. Uh, next slide. That talks about empathy and sympathy. What is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, 
It's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Thank you, Brene Brown. Next slide, please. So that was Brene Brown on empathy. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Give me a second. No worries. Yeah, so I see in the chat, like a lot of folks have been yeah, on the receiving end of sympathy, right? And it's quite starkly different from um, being, uh, having a response of, of empathy. So uh, empathy and sympathy are like not the same thing. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, when we sympathize, we can see, like, recognize emotion in someone, we can see they're disappointed or frustrated or feel um, various emotions like betrayal, sadness, um, but we haven't made the leap to empathy, right, which is based on taking on someone else's perspective and recognizing what they might be feeling, right? It sounds kind of simple, um, but empathy and sympathy, um, but, when, but often when we're thinking about empathizing, we're really sometimes often just sympathizing, um, which is when we kind of scramble and panic to make someone feel better to solve their problem um, because we feel uncomfortable with the emotions that they shared. So we try to put a you know, silver lining on it. And in science, I think it's true that a lot of problem solving is you know, meant to be more efficient, you know, um, and the solutions are often in line with the scientist. So, but in the engagement process, you know, our first step is not going to be trying to make it better immediately. We're actually gonna refrain um, from judgment. We're act or actively, we're gonna instead actively listen and reflect in order to make the person in front of us feel heard and understood. Um, so whether that's a colleague or a community you're trying to work with or conduct research on. Um, next slide. So this is the motivational interviewing technique that many fields outside of the social work practice use. Um, let me know if you've heard of it in chat. Um, so this is not to make you a certified therapist, um, but these are really helpful tools that I have used to build my voice as an advocate when I want to be a source of support or guide someone to help solve their own problem. Um, so how we communicate is a tool and an intervention in itself, right? So how we're going, so we're going to go into like a mini role play again, just um, unmute your mic or chat. But first here is what we're practicing. This is a method called ORS, O-A-R-S, which means open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries, which are ways to respond to someone. So open-ended questions makes a really big difference. What does it feel like to be on the receive, receiving end of a series of closed-ended questions, right? Yes or no kind of answers. It feels like an interrogation. When we mix it with open-ended questions, it becomes more of a dialogue. So did you go to the store today? That's a yes or no question. Versus how was your experience going to the store today? So that opens up a world of opportunities in, the, in that response that the yes or no question is gonna negate. Um, so then affirmations also is a means of pointing out the strengths in the person that they don't think exists. Um, and when we reflect, we add our own analysis um, with the intent to help people resolve their uncertainty or show that we're just listening. 
Uh, so someone might say, you know, I felt better after I took the test, even though I was nervous. Um, and a reflective response might be something like, oh, you, you felt empowered by, you know, doing something that you were initially afraid to do, right? So you're um, providing your own, uh, you're making connections for the person that's going to help them maybe problem solve or see something in themselves, maybe a strength. Um, and being able to summarize what a, uh, what a person just said is a great way to convey that you're learning, you're listening. It's a great way to, con to organize information. So MI is a widely used intervention because it can make someone feel validated. It highlights the person's strengths, facilitates healing, it builds trust and problem solving. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds to give an empathic response like in the moment. Um, so it's a great exercise to just sound it out. And that's what we're gonna do. Um, Kyle, next slide. And I see Lex has heard about the auras in nursing. Awesome, which is amazing and very empathic. All right, Kyle is gonna read out the the speaker and then anybody who feels comfortable can be the listener and just share an affirming statement. So you're trying to find a strength. All right, Kyle. <clears throat> All right, I'm ready for y'all's responses. Um, I made it through undergrad with two summer jobs and endless all-nighters just so I can pay for textbooks. And I still feel like I don't belong in this evolutionary biology program. Yeah, so what emotion does Kyle feel when he says, I still don't feel like I belong in this evolutionary program? Maybe he doesn't feel like he belongs. Maybe imposter syndrome, maybe guilt, maybe fear, anxiety. All right, so what's a strength that Kyle is, or sorry, yes, Kyle is exhibiting right now, you know, even though he's feeling not so great? John says, yikes, I vibe. Yikes, I vibe, yeah, so re relatable. Would, sorry, um, would an affirmative response sound more like, um, well, you've been working really, really hard. Um, you know, why do you feel like that? doesn't go into belonging in the program. Right, so yes, recognizing the hard work that he's put in, right? He's not seeing that he's working hard. Um, but you pointing it out is, you know, even though you feel like you're feeling really overwhelmed, you still worked really hard to get into this program and you made it, right? I mean, sometimes that's enough for someone to hear. Um, so thank you. I can't see who said that, but thank you for that offering. Um, okay, we're just going to move on uh, just for the interest of time. So we're just going to skip over these. But you get the idea of communication needs to be deliberate, right, and intentional. Um, so non, so silence, right, and the nonverbal. There's also the use of silence, um, which can be equally validating. It says, I'm okay with what you just shared with me. I'm here with you. You don't always have to have the answer or make things better, but you must always try to have your full presence with uh, the people with whom you're trying to build solidarity. So try to get to know their story. Okay, so social workers were used to sitting with people who are in physical or psychological pain. Um, so you as scientists, your ability to listen and reflect and respond with empathy is going to help to build connections rather than drive this connection. So next slide, please. All right, so of course we have all practiced empathy before, um, but what is the social justice purpose of empathy? When we put ourselves in other people's shoes, we make um, the shift from, you know, that sucks for you to I identify with your struggle and I see my experience is tied to yours. And that's, um, you know, that's the solidarity mindset that we need to move towards mutual liberation. Um, other frameworks that utilize empathy are what's called the person and environment perspective in social work practice, where individual behavior, you know, what, who you, how you show up in a space is seen as a product of the many overlapping worlds that you occupy. So my positionality as a cisgender Filipina from New Jersey influences everything that I do, you know, and informs how I even do my social work. Um, and this ties into intersectionality. And you can type into chat all the different types of intersections that you know. 
Um, but both concepts really help us make visible the multiple oppressions that impact people. So for example, working class indigenous folks are gonna have a different experience from indigenous people with class privilege. Um, so from there, we can really actually identify the root oppressive systems and make informed decisions for change. Next slide. A lot of different um, categories, social identities, class, language, age, ability. Um, and it really helps us clarify how even identities of disadvantage, there can also be privilege. We can't just assume that every marginalized racial identity is going to is marginalized in other areas like class, gender, immigrant status. Um, so this drawing it also represents you, right, as a scientist with multiple social identities, and how does that influence how you do your science? Next slide. Um, and just please note the content warning um, for mentions of violence, um, Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQIA uh, people in this section. So we need empathy in the field of sciences. We need to respect human dignity and worth um, and self-determination because there's a long history of distrust in scientific institutions um, from working, black, working class, black, indigenous, LGBTQIA plus and two-spirit folks. And these are just some of the examples. Um, from the 20th century, the eugenics movement led to the experimentation of black and indigenous people to prove a superior white race from the LGBTQIA plus uh, community, the atrocities of non-compulsory surgery on intersex children, and how that imposes heterosexism and, and you know, violates agency from the beginning of someone's life. And in the mental health field, the diagnosis of homosexuality as a legitimate mental, mental disorder uh, was in the DSM-5 until 1973. Um, and for me, as a social worker, I've had a family member of a a black male patient in his 60s who had to undergo an emergency surgery come to me and ask if the doctors were experimenting on him. And that was in 2019 in New York Presbyterian Hospital, right? That's the number one hospital in, in New York. Um, so next slide. So that distrust is real. And instead of, you know, defense, getting defensive, we, we scientists, social scientists included, need to validate and honor that dark history in order to address its harmful consequences in the present day. Um, reproductive justice for black women is a, is a really startling example of the legacy of slavery. Um, so why are black women still more likely to die from pregnancy or in childbirth than white women? So a couple of factors are against black women, like racial bias in healthcare, medical neglect from practitioners. Um, studies show that the compounding impacts of institutionalized racism result in destruction to the body, hypertension, poor mental health, lack of sleep, polluted air. Um, and yet the field of gynecology like owes so much to black women who, to enslaved black women who, uh, whose child rearing practices made them objects of experimentation, right, like we saw. Uh, next slide. So there's also um, the health impacts of resource extraction on the First Nations land. Does anybody, can anyone guess, you can unmute or chat, how many abandoned mines do you think there are in the Western United States? You can just call out numbers. Thousands. Yeah, so more than 160,000 abandoned mines. Yeah, upwards of 5,000, quite a lot more. Um, and these are mines of uranium, copper, gold, and lead in the Western United States, which is the home of a majority of Native American lands. Can anyone guess how many Native American peoples live within um, 10 kilometers or six miles of one of these mines? Yeah, thank you for everyone sharing, John. Um, about this quarter. Yeah, the numbers are high. Right, so it's more than a million, more than a million Native American communities are exposed to these mines. Um, and this is a federally sanctioned settler colonial violence, right? It's an example of that. Broken treaties, ineffective policies, poor infrastructure and reservations, a lack of research in Native communities are resulting in chronic exposure. Um, yeah, it's really heavy, really heavy stuff. And let's just go to the next slide. 
So the very soil and water of First Nations lands are contaminated by federal government programs. Why did the government displace indigenous people and poison the reservations that they forced them on? So uranium mining started to develop, started in order to develop an atomic bomb and a nuclear arsenal, uh, which was the priority of the United States during the Cold War in the 20th century, mid 20th century. So this is an example, right? Science is a tool of militarization to further US imperialism and its agenda and technology not being synonymous with progress. And uranium lives in the body. It can cause kidney damage, bone diseases, developmental problems. And even just a little bit in the water can really result in some negative reproductive health impacts, including decreased fertility, reduction in testosterone, right? And decreased fetal body weight. Uh, next slide. So there are vast racialized health disparities in the US that are clearly reflected in the percentages of working class and black and white um, uh, children and adults who do not have access to the human right of healthcare in the United States. And notice um, First Nations people aren't even reported in these um, US census data. So for us scientists, what's the, goal, the end goal? You know, finding cures for life-threatening diseases that only a portion of the elite population really benefits from. So when do we start questioning the institutions that funds our research and at what point do we ask them right, what we're making science for? And what policies are creating barriers for people to access my science? You know, can a system so inequitable be reformed or does it have to be abolitionized? Um, next slide. Sorry for the siren. It is alarming. Um, yeah, so thank you for the resources, uh, Olivia, and chat about how violence on the land is violence against indigenous peoples. So the other reason why we need empathy as an imperative of, of science is because of trauma. Trauma is a residual uh, physical and psychological response and um, impact to a once or ongoing experience of torture oppression, abuse, sexual assault, and displacement. Trauma changes the way the brain works. Neuroscience shows that trauma releases a stress response, right, fight, flight, or freeze, that when we're triggered, the victim or survivor feels as if they're reliving the traumatic stimulus again. Um, so your job as a scientist may not be to heal someone's trauma, psychologist or a therapist, or, but you're always engaging with trauma to the land and the people, no matter what, right, it's our history. Um, and it's important to exercise empathy because often symptoms of trauma can be misinterpreted as aggression, hostility, or just a natural quality of someone's racial or social identity. So this leads to bias and informs how we treat our patients, our colleagues, and even just stakeholders. Um, next slide. Um, so when we use empathy, we become more in sync with another person, right? We mirror them like we're dancing with them. And that's partly why people seek um, things like yoga and martial arts and dance after experiencing a trauma, because it can create like new, it, new neural pathways and help people cope with that destabilizing impact of trauma. Um, there's something really healing when you can kind of have someone else uh, be present with you and kind of mirror your movements. Um, let me know if you've ever experienced that before in your own life. Uh, so what can we do as scientists to be trauma-informed? Um, we can be more aware, right, and appraise our practice. How do our surveys, instruments, and research questions unintentionally harm a survivor or a victim, especially when, when it comes to the body? So type in chat if you know of or anticipate the kind of trauma or traumatic responses that might be present in your field. And when we destigmatize trauma, we communicate to people that their pain can be known and spoken about. We create space for trauma, the trauma story to be told, and it liberates us from that secrecy. Um, and that's how we start to recover as a community. If someone tells you their trauma story as a scientist, they might not recognize the bond that you made with them and honor that courage it took to heal and tell the story. Yeah, early childhood experience. Feel free to keep chatting. So nothing about us. Oops. Thank you. Nothing about it uh, about us without us is a philosophy from the international uh, disability rights movement. Uh, 
No worries, Kyle. And they assert that there is such a thing as an oppressive knowledge production. Um, this, slogan, this slogan has been incorporated by different populations from the homeless um, to sex, sex workers and people with disabilities. Um, and remember, disability is a social construct. Our able-bodied, cis-normative world creates disability by modeling big uh, buildings, you know, cars, infrastructure, and even school curriculums for able-bodied people um, to the exclusion of those with either visible or invisible both disabilities. So in reality, disability, but in reality, disability is a widespread experience. It's not an other. And as researchers in social science and STEM, we like to study those populations, those marginalized populations, but how often are we getting their consent and their input in our intersection? And your research, this research has an impact, right? As scientists who do research on marginalized communities, um, a study shows that the exclusion of disabled people in research about them reinforces their representation in poverty, right? They're highly um, represented in poverty statistics. Um, so in other words, how can you write about a population you know, without them? You know? And it shapes the resources that they can access. Um, so we need to we need reliable statistics. We need to include people with disabilities in the decision making process, and we need to avoid helicopter research where we go into communities and take their knowledge without plans to give back or amplify their mission and develop long term relationships. Right? It's not enough to do research. Research can be a distraction. Um, we need to challenge the power relationships that materially impact people's lives and actually make moves to shift them. Um, next slide. Um, just going back on the question of what trauma responses are seen in each field. Robin says, I'm a dance movement therapist and I work in a hospital. Lots and lots of trauma stored in the body. Hila says, violence towards non-human animals, land. And yes, thank you for that term, non-human animals. Um, humans are also animals too. Um, and if we're talking about indigenous knowledge systems, um, humans are in relation to um, non-human animals, and we should we should treat them as our relations. Um, Kyle says, doing research on developmental psychology and ethnicity, lots of survey questions that ask about discriminatory um, experiences. And he says, having to sit through my um, peers' research presentation about suicide risk when I was in undergrad ended up triggering me into having to skip class the rest of the day. We'll never forget that. Yeah, thank you so much. And even as people, right, not even just as scientists and scholars and academics, we can be triggered by what we're exposed to. Um, so, so much empathy to all of you who shared. That's really hard. And um, it's great to see that you can recognize the, the pain of other people, right? That's what happens, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So we arrive now at the scholar Yoso's community cultural wealth model. So under capitalism, we tend to view wealth only in monetary terms, right? As a measure of one's assets or property, which is a really disempowering way of looking at communities who are poor or working class or even uh, peasant farmers in the Philippines. Um, so let's reframe this deficit perspective and expand our idea of wealth, right? And according to Yoso, community cultural wealth is an array of knowledge and skills and abilities and contacts, networks, possessed and utilized by communities of color to survive and resist macro and micro forms of oppression. You know, and they come in these different forms, aspirational, resistance, linguistic, navigational, family, capital, spir uh, and spiritual, and add spiritual. Um, so in chat, can you name any everyday examples of any form of capital listed here? Um, so for example, aspirational capital, the ability to maintain future hopes and goals regardless of barriers. That could be having a, a cousin who opened up their own business, knowing someone in your family who, or someone who looks like you, um, having that capacity or having opened a business, opened the whole world for you, right? The aspiration, like that's who I can be too. Um, and there's so many different forms, but the point here is to really look deeper, right? Identify and document cultural wealth and the ways that people are already empowered in themselves. 
even if a community is marginalized, um, there are already assets and there's already abundance in that community, but we are not looking at it. If we're just um, perceiving people through the lens of capitalism or the lens of um, wealth. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. All right, so people are experts of their own experience and people have an intrinsic resilience. Uh, we must accept that you know scientific degrees don't alone confer expertise. Ordinary people are experts of their own experience too. Lived experience is also uh, crucial as much as uh, data or an evidence-based practice. And we have to view everyone as a, an agent of change um, and that they have the capacity to change their world uh, for themselves, you know, and it's science for them, not for us, you know, if we don't abide by that. If we do science just for the Academy or for the Nobel Prize, the publication. So in addition to you know, subject matter expertise, scientists are also facilitators and advocates and collaborators. Um, next slide. And I thank you, Miles, for Navigation Capital. Parents who have graduated from college share that knowledge with their kids. Yes. When you're a first generation uh, student um, and you have parents who are uh, immigrants and they teach you how to navigate systems, right, that have been at times hostile to them. You know, that's a form, that's a strength. Um, so how can we harness that? So here we go, enhance community strengths. That's what we need to do. Science for the people fundamentally honors people's self-determination and enhances the strengths that already exist. Like Miles was saying, the navigational capital. Okay. It's about using our platforms as scientists in, in academia or even in the field to give community members the megaphone to speak and teach us how to do our science. And as we analyze the environment, it's not only the locus of the intervention, it's also the source of the solution. So next slide. And that's Carla, our founder of Axon. It's at the uh, People's Data Coordination Trust last year. So science, um, so let's approach communities to which we're an outsider with intention and respect. Like, oh, I forget who said, but um, the question that we had in the beginning, the really great question of how do we approach these communities as settlers, do it with intention and respect. Be invited to participate. Don't just jump in, right? Remember, we can't just go from intervention, go to intervention immediately without understanding the issue holistically. Um, and I argue that the issue really needs to be defined by the people that we serve, right? So, and sometimes we need to accept that some aspects of the community are just not for us to intervene, not for us to research on, um, so it's complicated and trust can be built, but also is really tenuous and can can dissolve at any time, right? So that's why engagement is ongoing. So we need to respect boundaries as well, you know, support the most marginalized and their acts of autonomy um, and see your liberation as Filipino AX scientists as tied to theirs. Um, that empathy, the jump to empathy. So let's go to the next slide. And to reference, oops, before. Okay, so to reference the angat, uh, which means elevate, um, philosophy that we, we as AFSA use to celebrate our first year, we need to know our history. You know, Filipino AX scientists have multiple identities. You know, our diaspora is united by this revolutionary history that we see here, you know, from Lapu-Lapu beating up Magellan to um, indigenous uh, activists fighting for their land, right? Against mining, against plunder. So let's learn history written by the people, right? Include indigenous Filipinos who have been unrecognized experts and protect protectors of the land and its biodiversity and really use our science as a platform to tell that story. And I'm gonna pass it over to Kyle, thank you. All right, thank you, Christiana, and thank you everyone who has been sticking by. Um, we have about 12 minutes left, so we do have some closing remarks, um, and then we will actually stick around um, afterwards for people who are interested. Um, but uh, we do want to close with this, um, these ideas of empathy, solidar solidarity, and liberation, right? Um, and so as Filipino, Filipino, Filipinx science advocates, right, 
we have a duty, right, to disrupt these interlocking systems um, in our personal lives, in our scientific lives. Um, we've talked a lot, Olivia talked a lot about this idea of settler colonialism, wow, settler colonial harm, there we go, um, against poor and working class black and indigenous communities, right? And so we have to look and search for this mutual liberation. But again, that begins with that trust and that intentional actor, um, action that Christiana um, has emphasized a lot, right? And again, I love this quote or this uh, mantra of elevate, right? Um, not just elevating science, not just elevating truth and not just elevating knowledge, but elevating people's rights to land and self-determination, uh, right? So I think, you know, if we really truly believe in angat, right? In this powerful statement of elevating, um, what does that look like to, um, to other contexts, right? Not just, out, like, not just within our own community, but outside of it as well. So really challenging these systems, challenging our own interpersonal biases, challenging our workplaces. Um, and yeah, hopefully all of us, again, like this is what I, the way I like thinking about is that we're all sharing this journey, right? No matter where we're coming from, right? We had a very diverse sort of um, mix of people in this um, conversation tonight, right? Whether they were indigenous, whether they were um, studying in like abroad in another country or like in the United States or whether they're studying science or um, maybe they're not, right? But whatever the background, um, I think we're all on this journey. We're all on different parts of the journey, but we're sharing it at the same time, right? Um, and so, yeah, this idea of mutual liberation, um, making sure that we have these trusting partnerships. Um, so we kind of wanted to end on sort of an empowering note. Um, to really leave y'all, this is sort of the big take home message, right? Um, if you somehow zoned out and didn't take anything else, this is kind of sort of what we want y'all to carry with y'all, um, right? Whatever you learned leaves, right? And this is really the thing that we want to see being applied. I mean, we challenge y'all. Um, I think it's not, it's easy to say it and present on it and talk about it, but really applying it um, is going to be the challenge, but it's a challenge that we all um, are in together. Um, and so, yeah, uh, really making sure we co-create Right, and, and I love that word, co-create, because I think it, it does sort of capture what we're trying to do. Again, re-envisioning what the future of science looks like, not just for those who have had the power historically, who have the power currently, you know, in a lot of ways systemically and in terms of funding, right? But also co-creating um, science that includes and uplifts and elevates, right? The poor and working class, black and indigenous um, people and their futures as well. Um, and in particular, right, since we do want to sort of contextualize it within um, the audience and our demographic as Filipino, Filipino, Philippine X scientists, right? Um, someone mentioned this before. And so uh, we are like Philippines is a huge um, export of labor, right? One of the largest exporters of labor, um, if not the largest exporter of labor um, when you factor in proportion, right? And so we have, it's, it's a lot more nuanced, right? So we have a lot of privileges but at the same time, we have all of these barriers that are happening to us, right? Um, or for a lot of people. Um, so labor export policies, um, Duterte's, um, right? The current presidential re um, regime right now, um, the current pandemic, um, disparities that are occurring both in health and um, in nurse deaths, right? Someone brought that up earlier too, right? Um, so thinking about all of these system level things and the exploitation of Philippinex labor, and that includes scientists, right? Um, so again, sort of taking a big picture and being hyper aware of, of what is going on in this point in history, um, what is the context of where the world is. Um, and you know, this past year up until now, 2020 has been quite the year. I think we can all sort of agree on that. So um, again, yeah, thinking about what these barriers have been and how they currently um, are currently affecting us right now. Um, and yeah, so this again, like the Philippines is the deadliest country in Asia for land defenders, right? Um, basically taking what we just talked about in the previous slide. Um, despite the Philippines being rich in a lot of resources, right? Um, with a lot of natural resources, um, there's still a lot of disparities and a lot of exploitation that's occurring. Um, so really bringing attention to what's going on, not just in the US, in the diaspora, but also going on back you know, in the homeland in the Philippines um, and being acknowledging of kind of the privilege we have um, and, and also sort of like our own positions.
Um, and so we did want to highlight um, just how important it is to uplift other members and other people who are uplifting communities. Um, so we have examples, um, Anita Luceshi, Suzanne Pierre, um, both working in a lot of um, environment and microbi uh, microbiology. Uh, we have, of course, um, Autumn Peltier, who's um, an advocate for clean water. We have our own uh, founder of AFSA and um, Carla, um, who's a PhD student. And then we also have Ray, um, who works a lot with uh, trans Filipino women. Um, and so again, I think the biggest takeaway from um, these pictures and these um, individuals is that um, you can carve your own path, right, wherever you are. Um, it doesn't have to be, there's no one right way to do it. Um, people have had a variety of different ways to use what they know um, as, as vehicles of change. Um, and so whatever your field is, whatever your research interest is, there is always a way. Um, and there's always a way in this journey to uplift and elevate. And so with that, uh, we just have these final action items um, for those who are interested. Um, in addition to this, we're also gonna have a resource list that will go out. We have a survey. So if you are interested in um, getting more resources from all that was discussed, um, yeah, all that was discussed in this entire presentation, we'll also share slides if people want that as well. So yeah, um, thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna, if Olivia and Cristiano wanna say anything um, and have some closing remarks, they can. Uh, please stick around though, don't leave just yet because we do have a survey. I think I can actually um, put it in the chat. Um, so please take the time to fill out this a survey because we do value your feedback. We wanna continue the conversation and find ways to make it better and um, do your part and let us know how we can um, give us your feedback and let us know how we can improve. So Olivia and Christiana, if either of y'all wanna say anything. Yeah, thank you all for being here. I know this was a lot of information to take in but this is just the beginning and we'd love to continue doing this. Um, we wanna hear from you through the feedback, the survey, how we can better facilitate our next discussion. And if there's a topic that you wanna explore, APPS is really a place, a platform for you to, to do that. You know, we have a platform, we welcome um, your voice. We wanna hear from you and all the intersections that you bring. So thank you, it's an honor to share space with you. Yeah, thank you uh, for um, joining us in this like awesome topic. Um, like, and you know, um, as like a member of Gabriella, New Jersey, which if you, any of you guys are interested in joining the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, um, Anakbay and Gabriella uh, Migrante, um, as well as others, um, please let us know, drop your contact in the chat. Uh, you know, stay organized. You know, scientists can be drivers of change. And it's important that, you know, that we just don't work individually, but, you know, like we work together um, against the system um, to recreate, like, recreate, um, future, or recreate, create new futures um, for liberation and for um, a future in which science can be for liberation. Are, are we staying for Q and A? Are we, what are we doing? Does anybody have any questions or something they want to share, reflection? Yeah, we're, we are done talking. So if anyone else wants to speak up, share insight, um, like feel yeah. free. Someone said they wish there was a snapping emoji. I can, I'll be your snapping emoji for now. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for participating and listening in and taking the time out of your Tuesday um, to have this important dialogue. So yeah, we'll be here. So ask any questions or comments if you have any, we'll stick around. Yes, yeah, so well, this has been recorded. So we will send out the recording to everyone who has participated. Right, I'll actually stop the recording now. <laughs>